Welcome to God of Rome. This is Will Sanchez. My special guest tonight is Ann Malum. She is the founder of Back of My Feet organization. She is also the chief executive officer. I heard about Ann and her organization last year from a guest on Gotta Run, Hideki Kino Shita. He met Ann a few years ago in Philadelphia when he did the Othra Marathon. He was so impressed with both Ann's story and her organization that he made Ann's Back of My Feet one of his signature marathons. Thanks, Will. Ann, let's get started, as I do with all my shows, by introducing yourself to our audience. Where were you born, something about your schooling, a little bit about your family. I was born in Bismarck, North Dakota. Um, my family's all still back there, actually. My mom, my dad, my younger brother and older sister. So uh, I miss them dearly. I don't get back as often as I would like to, but it was awesome growing up in North Dakota. It was safe and I had a big yard to play in, lots of kids around. It was really fun being a kid there. And I went to school in Minnesota, which is of course the neighboring state, at St. Cloud State University where I studied political science and public relations. And then I went to graduate school out at American University in DC where I got my master's in political communication. Excellent. Uh, when you were growing up, were you actively involved in athletics? Yeah, I was a major tomboy. I, uh, I loved sports as a kid and I can remember my mom wanting to send me up for softball and I knew that softball meant that I would have to play with the girls and I was not interested in playing with girls because I didn't think that they knew how to play sports. Uh -huh. So I made my mom sign me up for baseball um, so I could play with the boys and yeah, all my summers were filled with baseball or soccer, running, anything that I could do to stay active uh, was it, are full of my childhood memories. So. But at some point, running became more of a, a lifeline for you. I think like most people, running wasn't just my outlet to get exercise and to work out. I turned to running when I was a teenager to help me deal with some emotional turmoil that was happening at home when my parents were separating. Mm. My dad has had some major addiction issues in his life with drug and alcohol when I was a kid. I don't remember my dad ever struggling with those um, two substances and when I was a teenager gambling became my dad's activity of choice that he did a really good job of hiding for a couple years but like any addiction it usually comes to the surface and that happened when I was 16 and my mom had all too vivid of a memory of what my dad was like when he was actively involved in an addiction mm -hmm. and uh, she just knew that she couldn't go through that again so um, she and my dad separated the day that he told her and us about uh, the addiction. So the next three years of my uh, teenage career was pretty troubling for me. Mm -hmm. I uh, spent that time really resenting my mom. I didn't understand why she didn't want to help my dad. Mm -hmm. And I spent the time trying to fix my dad. I didn't really understand addiction. And I thought I could just get him to stop. I, you know, why don't you just stop gambling and we, everything can go back to being normal. But addiction right. doesn't work that way as mm -hmm. I discovered the hard way. And uh, so running was my outlet. It helped me um, feel strong. It helped me feel vulnerable and feeling okay feeling vulnerable actually. And I just learned all the life lessons that the sport gives you about taking things one step at a time and also learning that if I want to go run five miles, there's no shortcut to that. I have to do all of the miles in between. Mm -hmm. And same goes for life. If you try to shortcut life, you, you end up you're not getting all the benefits that you would get if you just put in the hard work. Before my whole, the situation with my dad happened, I had my whole life figured out. I thought I was gonna grow up, go to college, get married, get this amazing job, have 2.2 kids, have this big white house, and life was just gonna be that simple for okay. me. And so after you know realizing that life might be a little bit more challenging and things don't work out the way that you want them to, I was even that more determined to get to that point because I thought if I could just get there that I'll just have this elated, consistent happiness. So mm -hmm. I really worked hard at school and I graduated early. I ran my first half marathon when I was a sophomore in college, really, really loved it. It's always been a stable, consistent in my life. It's mm -hmm. been my best friend and it's also been my enemy at times. Mm -hmm. Now I'm a marathoner. Something happened in Philadelphia because you founded this amazing organization, Back mm -hmm. of My Feet. So 
what led to that? It was really organic. Well, the, you know, Back on My Feet wasn't started around some conference table of people thinking, you know, what, what is the solution to homelessness? And everybody's saying, oh, it's running. And why didn't anybody think of that before? It really <laughs> has made my whole personal life make sense of, of, you know, I think about my dad and obviously his struggles and his journey a lot. And I never had really any answers of why why that had to happen. Mm -hmm. It put a huge wrench in my plan and very difficult and there was never any good that came out of it. And so when I was between the ages of 24 and 26, that's when I lived in Philadelphia. And for me, which I think a lot of people actually go through, I started to feel that I wasn't having any purpose in life and mm -hmm. I didn't know what my mission was. I didn't know why I was here. And I was, it, it started to eat away at me. It was kind of this constant, you know, thing hanging over my head that I needed to find my calling. I got approached by Comcast to go work for them in their government affairs department and travel the country. And I'm like, well, this gets me out of Philly. I've never been in the for-profit world before, so uh -huh. this might be interesting and I might learn a lot about myself. Uh -huh. And maybe through this, I'll really be able to figure out what my true mission and passion is. So okay. I started interviewing and I, I said, yeah, I'm going to take this job if I get it. But something extraordinary happened in between that time frame and it happened when I was running. I had passed this homeless shelter hundreds of times before and I never really thought twice. But for whatever reason, in May of 2007, there were these jovial, fun group of guys that started to chat with me and wave at me. And they reminded me a lot of my dad, who is so friendly and so benevolent, but a little, little sarcastic and a little rough around the edges. Mm -hmm. So I was immediately drawn to these guys and I thought, why am I just running by them and leaving them there. Why don't I run with them? Why don't I share this amazing, non-discriminating gift mm -hmm. that I found that I, you know, found all the things I like about myself and really gave me strength and, and confidence and guidance. They could get the same thing that I got. So I called the homeless shelter and told him my idea and he very quickly reminded me that these guys are homeless, you know, that running is probably not going to be a priority for them. And right. I said, if you can just ask them, if you can see if anybody's interested, I'll take care of everything else. I'll be there three days a week. I'll get shoes, I'll get clothes. And then a week and a half later, I get an email with the names of nine guys is in their shoe sizes. They looked at you going, sure? I mean, they must have been a little skeptical, a little, what's, what's in it for you? Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's interesting that you say that, Will, because there was all those emotions for these guys. You know, here comes this, you know, young bl blonde woman in there who just wants to help, and, and they were so, untrusting of me right away. You know, what's what's the catch here? What's the scam? Why why are you doing this? And I opened up about my dad and about the sport of running, what it's done for me. And I made every single person in that room that night sign a dedication contract. And this contract said, if you want to be a part of, of this little running club that we're building, you need to show up on time. You need to be there three days a week. You have to come with a positive attitude and you have to support your teammates. And these guys initially looked at me like, who the heck am I to, to make these demands of them? I'm, I'm a stranger. But it was immediately, it was almost as if they were just waiting for someone to expect something greater from them. And this pride sort of set in and took over. And we all signed that piece of paper that day. And those guys, we had our first one on July 3rd of 2007 and everybody was there. They were there early. They were stretching and warming up and um, they were committed to being a part of what we were about to build. Well, what's the next major step after that? I had a lot of media contacts in Philly and I wanted to get the word out because right around this time I did get that call from Comcast and they offered me this job and I took it. I took it and asked for five weeks until I could get this little running club, which is all I thought it was going to be stabilized, that it would work without me when I was going to have to travel so much. They said, okay, we'll see you August 15th. And I, after I told the media, I'm like, I need to get the word out. This is a great story. The media had the same reaction as executive director in that, wait a minute, the homeless people don't run. This can't be happening. So that, you know, this unfortunate stereotype around homelessness mm -hmm. that they're lazy, that they it's their fault, that they don't want to work hard, and then you have this elitism about running. I mean, you know your friends who are runners, they're disciplined, they're responsible, they're focused, they're hardworking and they are dedicated. And a little crazy at times. And a little crazy at times, yeah. <laughs> it didn't make sense to anybody else. So all of a sudden the media starts doing all of these stories and more people start showing up. And this circle of me and these nine guys gets bigger and bigger. 
And there were two, um, two powerful things that happened in those next couple weeks that made me realize this could be something really amazing that could help people change the direction of their life. The first one was everybody, all these members who were living in this shelter were showing up every day and they were showing up on time and they were doing so on their own volition. I didn't have to force them. I had nothing to threaten them with and say, well, if you don't show up today, I'm not going to feed you. I'm going to take away your bed. Mm -hmm. I wasn't offering those things to begin with, mm -hmm. so I couldn't take them away. Mm -hmm. and I learned through my dad the hard way that you can't force anybody to do anything. It just doesn't work that way. So that was powerful to me. The second one was when I would track all of these guys' uh, miles on a poster board. And at the end of each run, I would color in the miles we ran, and it was cumulative from the days before, so you could really see the progress of this line moving forward. Mm -hmm. Whenever I would get to one of the guys, they would stop their chatter, hover over my shoulder, and watch me give them credit for their work. And that's when, for me, it was like, wow, no matter how many differences are between me and these guys, race, upbringing, socioeconomic status, religion, anything, at our core, we are entirely the same. As human beings, we are looking to be recognized, appreciated, valued, cared for, respected, and to feel good about ourselves. And these guys didn't have that. Mm -hmm. And we were giving them that. And if we could continue to do that, if we could change the way they saw themselves and have this emotional transformation occur, the theory was that we could then build in job training, education, employment, and you said housing. We, at that time, it was just you? It was just me, but it was a team now, you know? Your experience with your dad, if you didn't have that, this would not have happened. It never would have happened. When this idea started to form, not only did I see this sort of business venture in a nonprofit sense, my personal life was starting to make sense. And when your life comes together like that, in a way that you feel, and I felt like I'm just not that clever to plan all of this, the timing of it all happening, there's something bigger going mm -hmm, on here, mm -hmm. and I can either choose to pay attention or I can just let it pass me by. There's a group of about seven of us that were just sort of obsessed with this idea at the time. So I had met them and they were willing to help, and so we had these sessions at my house, you know, I picked a name back on my feet. I met somebody on the street who says, oh my God, I just saw you on TV. This is so great, can I help? He designed the logo we still use today and he mm -hmm. built the first website. I had experience in nonprofit work my whole life, so I knew who to ask in regard to what steps to take to get a 501c3. I had great friends who were lawyers in Philadelphia who took us on as a pro bono case to help us with all that process. Mm -hmm. We started writing down our mission and we started having events. And from a program perspective, we opened another team. We knew that we had to build something that could be replicable. That's the only, thing, that's the only way it's gonna grow. Mm -hmm. So design something here, take it here, take it here, and they almost op operate self-sufficient, the teams have to operate on their own, so you need different folks going to each one of these teams in the morning to participate and to contribute to the um, socialization that our members work having in these different facilities. Right, there's only one of you. So right. by different teams, you approach other homeless shelters, talk yes. to the director, yes. and now you had a success story with the first one, it right. would probably be more open. Sure, why not, let's give it a try. Exactly. I mean, what they have to lose. Right. So why did you expand beyond Philadelphia? If you started in 2007, mm -hmm. in five years, you've done something very remarkable. People will ask me, did you ever think it was going to be this big? And everybody asks, everybody expects me to be like, no, I absolutely didn't. But I never say that. I always say yes, and it's only going to get bigger. I, I just knew how special this was and that what people at their core need to be able to be successful and that we had all the right ingredients. We had... We have, unfortunately, a homeless problem that plagues every mid to major city in this country and other countries. We have a sport that is international. People are runners everywhere. It was my responsibility to figure out how are we going to get funded, how are we going to build and grow and have staff and really make this a comprehensive organization. And that came through our branding and our marketing and really paying attention to our messaging and taking care of our partners. Uh, some of those initial things in the beginning the Philadelphia Marathon, well, you might remember this, but the Philadelphia Marathon never used to sell out. 2007 was actually the year where that all changed. The race sold out a month and a half before. There was no warning. People had already bought their plane tickets, their hotels, and they thought they'll just register for the race when they get there. They've done it every year like that before. I happened to know the, the director who ran the marathon at the time. She calls me and says, and I'm gonna give you 30 entries. These people will not stop calling me. I'm gonna give them your number, you deal with them, sell them and make some money for the organization. And I thought, 
perfect, great. So people start calling. We've only been around for three months. You know, these are people calling all over the country. I start telling about back on my feet. Nobody cares. They just want to know if I have a marathon spot. And I say, <laughs> we raised four, over $40,000 in three days. Excellent. So yeah. you were fundraising for you. Yes. And you, at, at that point, you didn't know what to charge. Right. I didn't know what to charge. <laughs> sort of a seat at the pants. How did you pick the next city? Or did the city pick you? It's a great question. And to back up just a little bit, in December of 2007, I was working on a Thursday, and I get a call from ABC World News, and they say, we hear you're running with homeless people. And I said, you know, y yes, you know, we don't say that term. We say people experiencing homelessness. They said, well, we'd like to come do a story. So they came down that Friday morning. They taped for six hours and aired it that night on Charlie Gibson, um, Person of the Week. And, and the floodgates opened up, emails, donations, uh, a $15,000 foundation donation. It was crazy. So by that time, we had enough money put away. We had over $80,000 put away. We had no staff and went into the new year in 2008. No paid staff. No paid staff. You had volunteers. We had, exactly. You had staff. Very good point. We didn't have any paid staff. So 2008, I hired my first person, which was not myself. It was a gentleman named Andy. And then we kept building. CNN called. They do a piece. So we were raising this money by, by raising our profile. And frankly, well, we didn't really know what we were doing. We weren't even a year old, and we're getting all of this attention for our work. And we're like, Let's just hope that this actually works the way that we think it's going to. So 2008 goes by, everything is good. And in the middle of 2008, we said, you know, we owe it to the to people out there who didn't get the shot at life that they deserve to grow this thing. We have to try in another city. No one thought it was a good idea. It was 2008. It was a horrible time to be expanding. The economy was not great, mm -hmm. but it was like, you know, how else do you learn? You just got to do. But the homeless population was probably growing. It was probably it was growing. And so we picked Baltimore because it was far enough away from Philly where Philly couldn't be used as a crutch, but it was close enough that we could keep a really good eye on it. And it was small enough that we could actually afford to learn some lessons there. Obviously, Baltimore was a success. Then it just steamrolled after that for the other cities. We watched Baltimore for a year. We made some mistakes, which we expected. And we, we said, OK, we did this right. We didn't do this right. Let's change this. Let's, and, then, and then they're ready to go to DC. So from March of 2010 to March of 2011, we opened five new chapters. That mm -hmm. was pretty ambitious. Yeah. I have a feeling people don't say no to you because <laughs> you, you don't grow this thing you know, it's by simply asking. You sort of have to demand it, and you seem to be very good in demanding things, and people respond to you. Mm -hmm. So what was your first corporate sponsor? We had a great piece in Runner's World in 2009. It's my favorite. I mean, the way that this is written is just, you, you, you close that last page and you just, you're just rooting for these guys. You just want to see them succeed. And so there happened to be a gentleman of Larry Solomon, who's now our chairman of the board in Philadelphia, who worked for Accenture, and he was the chief operating officer for one of their divisions. Larry shoots me an email, says, hey, just want to say congratulations. This is great. I've just become a runner myself. Good luck. I tell Larry we're meeting for coffee. He says, no, I don't have time. I said, well. You're going to make time. So we meet. We have a great conversation. Um, he's one of my dear friends now. And Larry really started connecting us in Philly, helping us in Accenture. Um, and after that, Accenture does work for Marriott. So that's how we got to Marriott. Um, at and is also another big partner okay, of ours. So it's a networking We just thing started building. And you have to start networking. What I've learned is if we can just get a meeting, we can produce good results because of all the inventory that we've built in terms of campaigns and events and opportunities to get involved with us. We've really diversified all of that stuff to make it to make something appealing for our partners. You're now in New York, mm -hmm. and how is that going? Because you started in April of this year. Our teams are doing so great. So we have 55 members. We work with five different shelters here in New York. We will probably add another team um, in early fall, so we'll have six teams. So they run every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 5:30 a.m. from their facilities, so people can sign up to get involved if they live here in New York and want to participate. And we've done two different races now. Both have been 5Ks or so. We've started doing long runs. So we, are, we have people who are interested in running the New York Marathon this year, and we have a great partnership with the New York Roadrunners. As you get on the path to self-sufficiency and you move well beyond homelessness, you're going to have a big home in the New York City running community. to 
to be allowing us to have some of our members run, which was really fantastic. And it's going great. We're starting to focus on job training and then um, their education component. And next month, we'll really be starting to place some people um, from a job perspective. You also do the serenity prayer together. Mm -hmm. How did the serenity prayer come about? We thank you, God, from the crown of our heads to the soles of our feet. You're around a bunch of people that really so care and concern. And running, you get the feeling of that freedom, that sense of freedom. It, it takes me somewhere else. A healthy body, healthy mind. I want to run a marathon. I want to run a marathon. And I'm going to keep running from Ready? dusk to dawn. I want to be a Philly runner. When we're running, you can't tell. If people look at us, they don't point and go, oh yeah, he's homeless, she's not, he's educated. You look and say, oh, look at the runners. That's a positive association because there's no separation. We just were all gravitated to each other from the very first day. You know, we were giving hugs, high fives, and we just naturally circled up before we ran and we put our arms around each other. We evolved that sort of deep prayer into the serenity prayer because it, it's, it's non-secular and it has this fantastic message about focusing on the things that you can control and letting go of the things that you can't and being smart enough to know the difference between them. I mean, yeah. everybody needs that reminder. It's a beautiful prayer and, yeah. and, I, and I love you know, the circle and, mm -hmm. and the hugging. And you do that when you meet, when you're recruiting people, mm -hmm. so people know what they're getting involved exactly. in. Exactly. Runners are the ones that are stepping up to volunteer because you can't be in all these places. You've got enough people doing that. Mm -hmm. that, that is amazing. So we try to take everything, Will. Everything that we do is about self-sufficiency, from our business model to our program model to the people we're trying to help. So we have 46 full-time staff around the country at this point. So you grew from that one person, yeah. Andy, that did the website and the mm -hmm. logo, to 46 around the, uh, how many cities now? Nine. But that's a, we're still a very small group mm -hmm. doing amazing work. Yeah, they really, really are. We have a great team. So they have a, they have a staff locally, and, and then they have volunteers locally. So as you mentioned, each team has its own set of core volunteers that we call non-res that are there every day. Uh, the team leader is the person who leads that team. They have a big responsibility. Yes, yes. They're, you know, they are responsible for the, really the culture of that team and the energy and everything else. And it's, it's amazing that in every market, every city we're in, those people are there. Um, it's, it's You're finding them. Unbelievable. Yeah, and, just, and just by word of mouth, it says, okay, back on my feet is here. And everybody's mm -hmm. heard of it through their friends. I heard of it through uh, Tokino. Yeah. He knows thousands of people around the world. Right. And so having him on board. It's, it's uh, fantastic. golden. Yes. And then, of course, all these major companies. We also want to touch upon, go through the steps. I'm a homeless person, or I'm a person experiencing homelessness. Mm -hmm. I sign up to the program. What is it that that person is suspected to do, and what's the payoff for him? What is success for that person in, in your organization? Sure. Great question. So the first step for us is giving a presentation at the facility. Let's use the Bowery mission because it's one of our teams here. We give a presentation. We pass around a sign-up sheet for who's interested. We get a bunch of names on there. We vet that name list with the facility director. The person might say, these people are a great fit. This person's not for whatever reasons that we've talked about who makes a good fit. After that happens, we do orientation. Let's just say right now we have about 14 people on the team. It's a, it's a bigger team. We usually don't like the teams to be more than 15 just because the quality is important. So every month we're adding two or three people depending on, again, where the team size is. So let's just say, Will, you're one of these people. You come to orientation. We talk to you about the program. We're very clear with you that this is not a running club. This is a running-based program that is going to help you change your life in the way that you want to if you want to. Mm -hmm. um, we let people know that there's going to be financial literacy courses, there's going to be job training education that you need to be a part of. If you don't want to do those things, if you have no interest in moving your life anywhere from where you are currently, this isn't the program for you. And we ask you to not participate. But if you want to get out of this situation, we're here to help you. So you say, yes, that's what I want. You sign the dedication contract still, still with some other paperwork, legal paperwork and everything else that we have. And then you have your first run with us. We give you new shoes. We give you a uh, back on my feet uniform to run in. It's very important that it says back on my feet. 
and you have your first run with your new team. You will run a mile on your first day, and from there on out, we will track your attendance, your mileage, and your attitude. After your first initial 30 days in the program, if you have a 90% attendance rating with us or better, which means you can miss one day, and that's it, you then move on to what we call the next steps portion of the program, which is when we sit down and we talk about why you're homeless. Well, we have to understand how you got here, what are your struggles, what are your um, downfalls, what was your situation, what's your education, what's your, um, what are your interests, what are your skills, what are your passions, what do you want to do? We have to have a reference point so that we know what to focus on mm -hmm. with you. And you might say, I just want to get a job and I want to have my own apartment. So great, we know that you've had a background, let's say, in um, welding and your certification has lapsed. So we would say, let's get you recertified to weld. Uh, we will pay for that for you. Every member gets access to $2,500 through our program for these types of things that you need to move your life forward. So we'll take care of all that stuff for you as long as you continue to put in the commitment and the work. And for us, success, there's obviously emotional success that we look at and we celebrate, but the mission of the organization is to create self-sufficiency. So we want to see you with a job and an apartment, living on your own and contributing and being a productive member of society. Wow. And of course, they could still run. Of course. Of course. We want to <laughs> see them be an amazing continue, runner. And yeah. To continue to run, if not with your organization, with, with, with anywhere they want exactly. to. Exactly. Can you give us some numbers? How many people have gone through your program? Mm -hmm. Obviously. You strive for 100% success, but mm -hmm. uh, even the best baseball players strike out more times That's than any. Right. What is your, your batting average? Our batting average is 50%, which we're very proud of. So 50% of folks who start with us end up being successful through our program. We've helped over 500 people have a self-sufficient lifestyle. There are currently actually around the same number of people in our program, about 490, I believe, right now, that are currently active and running. And so we have about 500 alumni. But our numbers are, again, 50%, which the national average for folks who are successful with just shelter um, from what you see with the stats out there which can be misleading or whatever it's mm. what we have to look at though is 10 percent so we're very proud that we can supplement and complement some of the programs that currently exist and we can give folks a better yes. chance what is the women men ratio it's a men ratio of 80 percent and a women ratio of 20 percent and the median age in their 40s and then we have about 20 percent veterans do the women do better than the men in terms of the percentage of more than 50 percent pretty equal quick anecdote i'll take 30 seconds but we had our first women's team in philadelphia and we started this team in the winter it was cold and one thing that we usually ask in the morning is anybody have anything to share to say and the men are always like no let's go i want to get my want race in and my run in and see how fast i can be today when we asked that question to the women, all of the hands go up. So we were, you know, realized that this is really an emotional support system for the women. How can we sort of alter our program to be still exercising, but making sure that we are exploring the more communal side that the women were looking for mm -hmm. from back on my feet? Excellent. Well, Anne, I wish you great success. You're on Thank you. path to something wonderful here. The number sounds small, but great things start with the first step. Yep. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thanks, Will. Wow, that is amazing. It's lots of fun. Do you know which next city you're going to go? Austin. And then we're going to go to the West Coast and see what we can do out there. That's the plan for 2013. My goodness.